Uh, this lecture will have two components. Um, one thing is I wanted to speak a little bit about uh, an observation that several people have met, um, uh, uh, that, that have made uh, with respect to uh, the fact that, uh, with respect with respect to the fact that the code um, to implement uh, Conway's Game of Life is remarkably slower within uh, <laughs> Python compared to C. And I know this is something I've talked with Alexis quite a bit, but also uh, several other people have brought it up um, and asked, uh, asked about it. And I wanted to talk some about, um, uh, about uh, why this is and talk some about um, uh, cases where it's problematic and where it's not problematic and talk some about um, how you can, with a tool we've seen before, a profiler, how you can get some insight as to where the bottlenecks are and, uh, and address those bottlenecks. Um, this is an important consideration when we're talking about metalinguistic abstraction, that, that choosing a language that's appropriate for our problem, or rather choosing a language that's appropriate for sub-pieces of our problem. And so much of your, uh, your life as professional programmers is going to be about choosing the right language for the right area of your program. Um, sometimes this is forced by uh, the nature of the game. If, if you're, doing, um, you're doing work with a web app that involves uh, client-side, rich client-side interaction, as is typical, um, perhaps using Ajax, um, uh, perhaps using um, some JavaScript libraries like Node.js, etc., you, you're going to be using JavaScript you know, um, for, for those components of the client-side work. At the same time, on the server side, you're likely to be uh, having a choice between uh, a variety of different options, uh, whether it's uh, things like the Java Struts framework, uh, JBoss and Seam, uh, whether it's uh, uh, whether it's tools that, that provide server-side scripting instead and server-side instrumentation using uh, Scala or other languages and, and help enhance the modularity through that, or PHP, you're going to be choosing from a different set of languages on the server side. Similarly, if you're building iOS apps, you're going to be using Objective-C or Swift. And your choices are limited. But um, in many projects, we actually have some measure of choice between different platforms. Uh, and uh, it bears some understanding of the trade-offs between languages, both pro and con, but also some understanding of how they um, how they fit together and when when certain of the issues matter and when they retreat into the background. So we're going to be talking about this uh, with Python for a little bit today in light of your problem sets, um, in light of the assignments that you've turned in on Tuesday. Um, what are the sort of trade-offs that we see with the Python code? So I want to make some, some overall comments on Python, and I'm going to show you uh, a profiler uh, running in Python, similar to what we did in C, and, and use it to browse some of the results. So Python is notably, if, if we consider performance issues, it's important to keep in mind that Python is used extensively in a scripting context. Um, it serves as a very flexible, dynamic language for knitting together underlying uh, frameworks um, in a variety of areas. Uh, example would be the Django framework for um, providing rich web apps, a uh, very popular framework these days uh, for allowing um, very nice uh, charting and other, uh, other user interactions. Whether it's uh, Apache support for Python as a server-side server-side scripting language as an alternative to, say, PHP, whether it's uh, mathematical tools like Sage, which use Python for computations in, for, for uh, automating computations within the tools, or various CAD packages uh, and other computer-aided manufacturing or engineering or design packages where Python is used as a language as an alternative, say, to uh, to Lisp, um, which was an older language, uh, very has many interesting features, but was long for a long time. It's been used as the basis for tools like AutoCAD. Um, 
So Python is used extensively as a scripting language. And uh, this bears emphasis when we consider performance of Python code. Why is that? Why is it that I'm emphasizing scripting? There's a couple of reasons. Help me reason through this. Why is it that it's so important it's a scripting language? After all, it's a programming language. Um, why is it important it's a scripting programming language? What does that tell us about performance issues? It doesn't compile everything to runtime. Okay, good. So it is an interpreted language. The interpretation means that essentially when you give your program over, rather than going through a stage where you have your source code and it gets it gets compiled into, gets turned into some underlying executable representation. And we'll talk about different varieties of this in a minute, um, which is then run. Um, you know, and, and provide some, some output from your program. Uh, rather, the source code is just directly run here. So this is, this is you know, the, the compiled language root here, and this uh, here is the interpreted route. Okay, so it's an interpreted language. And why is that significant that it's interpreted? Well, one thing is essentially the system, for the sake of performance, we'll come back to some of the trade-offs, but for the sake of performance, the system has to discover what's in your program every time it's run. Not only that, if you have a for loop and it's iterating through a bunch of statements in your program, every time through that for loop, it's rediscovering there's an if statement. Oh, okay, what's being tested in the if? You know, okay, it's true. What do I do now? Oh, there's a statement here in the, con in the uh, conditional, in the consequence. I've got to uh, evaluate that. What's this next statement? Oh, it's an assignment. I've got to do that. It's rediscovering the structure of your program, the structure of each statement of your program, even if you're executing that statement 10,000 times. It's actually rediscovering it every time. There's a plus. Oh, okay, you're adding this to this, and then there's an assignment, and it's it's rediscovering that. In a compiled context, that structure gets discovered once, and rather than rediscovering it each of those 10,000 iterations, it's turned into, into assembly language or Java bytecode, for example, and a JVM, which can then be executed. So it doesn't have to go through this rediscovery of the structure of your program every time. It's an interpreted language. That goes along with scripting. It goes along with it being scripted. In scripting context, we are not infrequently creating the code at runtime. This used to be the province of hackers. You go back 30 years, people were creating code at runtime, actually generating the code or producing the code at runtime, or folks who were trying to, who are really close to the metal hackers who are trying to squeeze the last bit of performance out of their program or squeeze it into less space, et cetera. And um, the term that was then the term of art was self-modifying code. It was considered a black art. And, and it was considered something, you know, uh, that people who, who were uh, very, very um, talented programmers uh, could delve into, but not most programmers. These days it's different. In the scripting context, quite a bit of, of code gets actually auto-generated. Uh, if you go to the Scala Play framework, uh, JavaScript code is generated by the framework on the fly as, as you're hitting the website. And very commonly in a scripting context, you load in a .js file when you hit the page, right? It actually loads in and includes that .js file. And as a result, it's not available up front for compilation. It's available at runtime. So the fact that it's scripted means that it's more dynamic. There's more things left until runtime, until that page is accessed, or that Sage code is run, or your Python script is run in a Django framework. Um, there's more that's left to, to runtime. It gives more flexibility. Moreover, Within that context, you can take strings of, that are generated 
at runtime, maybe based on user input or what have you, and turn them into executable code. You can actually run them while that page is being rendered, you know, based on the submit that occurred just a minute ago or what have you, or based on the query that needs to happen. You turn it into code and you run that code and maybe it operates in your DOM or what have you. So scripting languages are interpreted languages and they kind of blur the distinction between data and code. In a compiled language, it's very clear what's code and what's data for the most part. You, you have the code, it's turned into assembly language and then that operates, turns into machine code or turns into Java byte code and then that operates on your data while the program runs. But in a scripting context, data, code, there's some data that's loaded in, turned into code, it generates code and runs it. That code is data being generated and then it's being run. So in a scripting context, it blurs the distinction between data and code and there's some performance trade-offs. It has to rediscover the structure of the program because the structure of the program may change. Hmm? It may change. So that's one aspect of scripting. And it turns out that it's really useful in certain scripting contexts to be able to generate that code automatically. It's not always, ladies and gentlemen, a performance hit. Sometimes you can generate code that is custom crafted to the data you have to operate on. And because that code is custom crafted to it, it actually can run pretty efficiently. Even though it has the interpretation overhead, it will actually run faster because there's it's really honed for your particular circumstance. I won't go into details of that. We may re-examine it um, the, uh, after after the break. But there's another side to scripting, ladies and gentlemen. There's another side to scripting I want to emphasize, and this one is even more important in terms of thinking about the practical trade-offs of a language like Python. Um, in the scripting context, think about a web page that's being generated by a Django, uh, a Django-based system. It's it's generating um, generating some content to be rendered in a browser by someone who's located across the world. Where are the performance bottlenecks in that context? Where where are the things that are really going to matter to that user? They're accessing the page from from uh, India, or they're accessing the page from China, they're accessing the page from Europe, and, the, and, and it's hosted by a server over in here in North America. A server, perhaps, for your 371 projects. Um, ladies and gentlemen, where are the performance bottlenecks for that? Do you think the, the interpretation of, of Python on the server is going to really going to really slow down the system a lot? Why not? Where, where, where will the bottlenecks often be? If you're rendering a web page, especially if it is rich content, what's going to take a while? The transmission of the, transmission of the, of the, the HTML and, and, the, and the data behind it in JSON or what have you to deal with the, the Ajax interactions, etc. Right? So, so there, are, there is overhead in this context associated with interpretation. It's not to say there's none. But often, that's not the bottleneck for a scripting context um, involving web-based design. What may take longer is the transmission of the data, the transmission of the web page, the rendering of it in the browser, um, the, the, the spinning up on the disks of the requisite data in the databases to populate it. Often with web-based apps, you know, you've got to do a pretty heavy-duty query to get the data to render to the user. And really, ladies and gentlemen, in that context, sometimes the interpretation, whether it's an interpreted language or compiled language, it's in the noise. It's in the noise. It's kind of like, you know, um, for those of you who take the bus, uh, if you have a bus stop that's recently close to you, you know, you could sprint to that bus stop and that's not going to get you to, to the university that quickly because um, you, you're going to be waiting for the bus and you're uncertain about when the bus arrives. You know, or, or for those who drive, 
you drive to campus, you know, you could make your driveway, you know, have five lanes in it or something like that. But that's not the bottleneck. You're going to be waiting for the lights. You're going to be waiting for the traffic. And, you know, if you think about things as a software engineer, a lot of the art of um, performance optimization, a lot of the art of choosing the right language is putting things in context and perspective. And recognizing particularly where the bottlenecks are. That's how you become a virtuoso in tuning things. Recognizing where, you know, what, what's a theoretic issue alone and what's actually a practical issue? Where are the real bottlenecks in this context? If for web-based scripting, it's not going to hurt that much that it's interpreted. That's going to be in the noise. It's going to be, it's going to be, you know, equivalent to a little bit more delay. You know, one, maybe, you know, one tenth of the delay for sending the page over, uh, over the ocean, needed to, to render it. So, so you know, that's not going to be a big hit. Let's think about some of these other systems, though. Um, you know, compared to, to sending the page, compared to getting the data from disk, from the database, to render on the page, the interpretation of the language is going to be pretty small uh, hit. Um, so Apache and Django, uh, web-based frameworks, it's going to be small. How about something like a mathematical framework, like Sage? And, and there's lots and lots of cases where Python is used for mathematical and scientific computations now. So suppose I'm doing big matrix multiplications and inversions. Suppose I'm, I'm doing code to do computational statistics on very large databases. Where is the performance bottleneck going to be for that case often? Where is the performance hit going to be? I'll give you a hint. It's not going to be you know, an interpretation of the language. And even these other things might pale compared to where the real performance hits are going to be. Well, often what's going on there is you're using Python or a similar scripting language, like the R scripting language, um, to call off to methods which are themselves written in C or written in C++. They're written in lower level languages because they have tight inner loops, maybe to you know, iterate through items in a data structure and total things up to perform a, a computation of the uh, standard deviation over a million records in a data set. And those underlying primitives in this language, statistical primitives or math primitives, those are where the, the, the cost will be. Maybe it's for matrix multiplication. You're taking the matrix inverse in a 100 by 100 matrix. I remember um, I was in, uh, so my freshman year of uh, university, I, I uh, took a multivariate calculus class. And we had a guest lecturer um, who came in. His name was Mike Arton. Um, and he told us that for his thesis, he was, he was a math uh, professor, and he did a math thesis. And as part of his math thesis, he had, to, he had to take the matrix inverse of an 80 by 80 matrix. And he was doing it <coughs> by hand. And he said he did it, if memory serves me, he did it seven times. Because he wasn't convinced that the answers were correct. And each of the seven times, he got it a different number. <laughs> it, was, it was horrible. It was horrible. Now, these days, you know, you could put it into a framework like Mathematica, Maple, Sage, and they could do this computation, but it's going to take minutes. The overhead for interpretation of the language in this case, for the, for the Python that calls off to that function, is going to be minuscule compared to the efficiency of that underlying, that underlying raw function. And as a result, the bottleneck there is not on, even on these issues here by and large. It tends to be, for many programs, it tends to be on the core sort of heavy duty, heavy lifting primitives that you're calling off to. So in the web context, in the context of heavy duty computation, in the CAD context, computer aided design, engineering, manufacturing, where you're doing really heavy duty computations to render it appropriately and so on, Python is not going to, a language like Python is probably not going to hit you for many cases uh, that much. Not nearly as much as Conway's Game of Life. 
in the computational statistics context also, where you're doing mapping over large arrays, um, those built-in primitives of the Python language, what, you know, supported functions, things like map, reduce, filter, those are implemented, ladies and gentlemen, in C. You call off to them, and if you're mapping over a million line array, you're going to be calling off to something that's implemented in C. It's going to be reasonably efficient. Now, I, I'm going to have a star there, and we'll come back to it. Um, but it's going to be reasonably efficient for many cases. Not for others, but we'll, we'll come back to it. And to the degree they take advantage of, of parallel um, computation, that's where you can get some big speed ups. Now, I think even in Python 3, although they've changed quite a bit how they handle things, I don't think they're yet taking um, inbuilt use of parallel computation. But those things are coming, and you've got to keep that in mind when you're dealing with scripted languages. That sometimes what they're calling off to, map, for example, may be done in a parallel way, in which case, you know, that's where the bottleneck and that's where the speed up may, may come from, the big speed up, if you're dealing with a million records. Okay, so, so we need to keep um, the fact that this is a scripted language in context. It's often used in cases where it's not going to be the bottleneck. The bottleneck is going to be in doing the database query, or it's going to be in sending things over the web, or it's going to be in, in the scientific uh, underlying primitives, or what have you. Um, okay. Uh, nonetheless, Python has a remarkable slowdown of over two orders of magnitude for, for this uh, code that we're dealing with here. I was doing some, some computations on it this morning uh, for, for my code. And you know, it's, it's remarkably slow, right? Something that takes seconds will take minutes, okay? Um, seconds with the C code can take minutes here for the Conway's Game of Life. So what's going on? What's driving this? What's, what's causing a slowdown? Well, there are a number of things that I want to talk about. Um, and they're worth thinking about because they help you understand how Python works. And one of the things was something we, we talked about in another class. And that had to do with the different notion of variables and the role of variables in Python compared to uh, languages that you may be more familiar with. Languages in the C family, including <coughs> Java, but also including, um, including uh, C itself, C++, etc. So in those languages, um, uh, we'll often have um, a variable, and the variable will be associated with some values. Now, those values may be um, integers, and the variable name will basically be, our, be, be referring to some location in memory. Okay? Um, so this may be our variable A, and it has three there. We're going to have a variable pi, and it's going to have 3.14159. Okay. Um, and we're going to have a, another variable, which will be string. Now, this string variable, this is going to refer to a location that's going to hold what in, in a language like C? What is it going to hold? If, if, this is a, if string refers to some location memory, what is that location going to refer to? Yeah, it's going to refer to some pointer over here in the heap. So I'm going to call this the heap here. Um, and these things may be in the stack or other statically allocated or statically allocated global area. But a string will refer often here to some object over here in the heap. Um, its last character will be zero, and it will, you know, this string will say something foobar, right? Um, okay. Um, so a string refers to something that holds a pointer to this. Now in a language like Java, the situ situation is very similar, except we don't talk about pointers in Java, we talk about what? So it'll be a reference. It'll be a reference to some data. And unlike in C, we don't have to take care of managing this and calicing it or malicing it and freeing it. Uh, unlike in C++, we're not newing it and deleting it. In Java, that's taking the, the details of managing this memory is taken care of for, of for us. We allocate a string. But the point is we still have a reference in this location associated with the variable. Okay, 
So that's C-like languages. We're actually storing these values here. And these names of variables are just, just names for these locations. And these locations will be different in, in a stack context, activation records, um, for successive calls to a function, say, recursively. But they refer to locations, OK? The situation in Python is quite different. How is it different? Does anyone remember? I talked about it in my intro to Python. I'll put it over here, out of fairness. OK? So, so in Python, what do we got? What do we got here? OK. So, so what, how is a variable different in Python than the picture over there? Over there, the variable denotes a location that contains a value. And that value may be a numeric thing, and it may be an integer, maybe a double, maybe a character, or it may be a reference to some object or pointer, which is kind of a, a, less, a less tightly managed reference. Um, so how is it different in Python? What is a variable? in Python? Well, a variable actually is a reference in Python to some value. A, a variable is going to be bound to some value. Maybe it's the value 3. Where does that value live? That value 3, where does it live in memory? Ladies and gentlemen, a value will, in Python, have its own location. Its own location. So we're going to have memory allocated for this, for this variable here. And, and the particular variable will be bound to that. And you may have remembered me saying, I remember Royce commenting on it, that Dangerous things can happen, because you can take a variable that has been referring to an int and later bind it to a string. Python will pair, say, OK, you want A? OK. A was uh, an int, and now it's a string, and soon it will be a hash table. It'll be a dictionary. That's up to you. Um, similarly, pi here would refer to 3.14159. Here's pi. Pi is referring to this. And it could be rebound to point to 3, which would have unsettling mathematical consequences. Um, and you know, here we have str, and it's, it's bound right now to this string, um, which might translate ultimately into, uh, into some, you know, some underlying things. But here it will say for bar. Um, it may have some characters behind it. OK, great. So in Python, we have variables that refer to values. And these values have to be allocated. Even a simple constant like 3 has to be allocated. So let's suppose, ladies and gentlemen, now I have a variable b in c, and I assign it to a. b equals a in c. What goes in here in c or in Java? or in C++, or in C Sharp, or in Objective-C. What goes in here? After this is done, what goes in here? Three. Three. I've assigned B. B takes on the value that, that has been held by, by A. What happens over here if I say B equals A? Make it be that points to the three. It points to this three as well. It refers to the same underlying object. And that has some trade-offs associated with it. But one of the trade-offs associated with this is that we have to allocate memory for these guys often out of the heap. We have to we have to go and say, we need one you know, space for an integer in memory. Just because we're doing this. And later, we might add 1 to this, and it becomes 4. And now we've got a 4 that's referred to by C. And we have to allocate memory there. 
that could be quite expensive. But you ain't seen nothing yet. Okay, now let's, ladies and gentlemen, let's go to an array. Just about a space for it. Maybe I should have left that. Okay, so now we have an array, and this is going to be an array of hints. Much like the array that encoded cell values in your assignment, right? It was holding ends, ones and zeros, right? Okay, so an array of ends. What does that look like in C? An array of ends. I have, I have a thing called array. I'm going to call it. Uh, I'm just going to call it. Um, yeah, array of. Uh, so call, I'll call it cell array. How's that? Cell array. Okay. So it's a cell array. Not to be confused with a vegetable. Um, what does this look like? What, what, what sort of structures are associated at runtime? When I run my program, what does this thing look like if I really drill down into it? It's just a single pointer. Okay, good. It's a pointer to what? What does it look like here? Well, it looks something like this. It may be heap allocated. It may actually be stack allocated. We'll come back to this issue of stack. But it will look like this. One and zero. One and zero. Um, I'm imagining it's the array of cells. One and zero. One, zero, one, one. And we did these as ints. They could have been smaller than ints, bytes. But, but this is, is something what it looks like. And it turns out that if you create an array of ints in Java, or in C Sharp, or in C++, you'll get a very similar structure. Okay. Now, let me ask you, just to <coughs> flesh out your Java knowledge, suppose this were in Java, not an int array. Suppose it were an int, an integer array in Java with a capital Capital I. I can't even remember my, my job. Is it cap 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 int or is it cap integer? Um, it's integer. Integer. Okay, thank you. Um, so suppose I have that. How would the structure be different? This is a integer cell array. Okay, um, cell array of cap I ints. Okay, what would that look like? <laughs> Okay, it'll point to an object, but it, it, the object will actually be a, an array here. But what will be it here in it? How will it be different from this guy? Each of those elements will be a pointer. Each of these elements will be a pointer to 1 and 0, like this. Right? Would you want to do this? If you have to. If you have to. There are cases where you have to. Maybe each of these is a reference to a you know, to an object or a specific subtype of object, some sort of uh, object, yeah. You have these a lot, but you, if you're dealing with integers and you're representing them as in this sort of way, you're going to lose a lot of performance. Why? Suppose I had a Java program that was out doing this instead of that for large arrays. Where is it going to be spending off in a lot of its time, particularly if it's creating new arrays as the space updates? What is it going to be doing? You're going to be allocating these things, particularly. Especially if your space is of size million. It's going to be spending a huge amount of time allocating the memory for ones and zeros individually. Each one is going to, oh, I need to find some memory for this one. Guess what, ladies and gentlemen? I'm sorry to tell you, but in Python, this is what you're getting. And if I assign A, a to be an element of this array. What's it going to do? It's going to bind it to one of these guys. Points to one of those. And if I assign one of these to be that, you can do that. So it's a big hit there. It's a big hit there for Python. Is you've got these these values that have to be allocated space for each element of that darn array. It's allocating space out for it. Okay, so that's that's going to cost you some. I would argue that that might outweigh just the cost. If we went to balance interpretation of the language versus um, 
versus you know the memory allocation. Sometimes the memory allocation would be a bigger hit. Okay. So variables are bound, and they're often heap allocated. They're allocated, they live in the heap. They have to be assigned values individually as sort of space in the heap. Okay. So memory allocation is often a big hit. Now, another issue that it's worth knowing about is that strings are immutable. So if you need to modify the contents of strings, like replace one thing with another, you're going to be, um, you're going to be producing an entirely new, new string which has some benefits. What are some of the trade-offs? Those who are in 371 in past years, what are some of the trade-offs of immutability? When we build something that's immutable, there's some, there's some costs and there's some benefits. What are some benefits? What are some costs? I just made an utterance about costs. Can anyone remind us? If things are immutable, what takes longer? Well, if we want to do some local change, some small change to it, we just want to change one thing in it. You need to rebuild the whole thing. You need to rebuild the whole thing, right? You have your space, and you all there is up here in the corner of the space is one thing that's changing, and you need to rebuild the whole space. Or you have a, um, you know, you have a string, and all you want to do is replace all the, the, um, uh, the spaces by new lines, or the periods by exclamation points, or whatever. And suddenly you're producing a big long string, a whole new string. Okay, so those are some costs. What are some benefits of immutability? Anyone remember from 371? Safety is a big issue because the bugbear, rightfully so, a parallel computation. The thing that prevents you from executing multiple things in parallel trivially um, and the thing that can cause big bugs in concurrency is often when you have dependencies or shared references. You update it from one and the other one reads it halfway through the update. That's a bad thing with a capital B. And as a result, you end up taking out synchronization, um, put in place synchronization mechanisms so it can't read it halfway through, et cetera. Ladies and gentlemen, you get contention between different threads. So it simplifies multi-thread, which is often where you get big speed ops. Um, it simplifies parallelization of things. Um, what else do you get through immutability? Well, in some cases, you have to copy less. Why do I say that? Why would you have to copy less with copy less with immutability? Anyone? Well, it turns out that often when we have data structures built out of values, like with strings in it, think about a, a hash table where, whose keys, the thing we look up, is a string. Why might it be really nice to have strings be immutable? Suppose strings weren't immutable. They can be changed out from under us. And we want to go add in a new element to this hash table with a certain key and a certain value associated with it. What do we need to do? Well, often we need to copy that string because after all, the string we're passing in is a reference to something that could be modified. And suddenly we'd be you know, poking at the internals of our data structure. We would change it, and it should be stored somewhere else, that key. And the hash table is none the wiser. So it would have to make a complete copy of that string at that time to make sure it's not changed out from under us. So the fact that strings are immutable actually allows us to build more efficient data structures in many cases, but it can have costs, particularly when you're throbbing them repeatedly. OK. now. Now, we're going to talk about another implication here. Okay, so, um, so I had talked with you, perhaps six lectures ago, five or six lectures ago, I talked with you about something called the, the call stack. What's the call stack? I also use the term activation record. 
So foo, suppose foo calls, what does it call? Bar. Thank you. <laughs> and what does that call? Baz. Baz, okay, yeah, what does that one call? Zap. Zap, okay, excellent, excellent, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> learned something. <laughs> fine, fine job there. Um, maybe I should put that on the final. Um, okay, great, so uh, foo calls bar, calls Baz, calls Zap. Suppose that we are drawing a call stack um, where uh, the stack grows upwards. Well, put something on top of it. Put something on top of it, like plates at that line in Marcus Hall. So what goes at the bottom? Foo. Foo. And in a language like C, what's going on here is that, language like C or Java, um, the variables of foo live on this stack. They're actually stored. They're actually stored here. So, so in other words, a a with respect to foo. If, if foo has a variable called a or a parameter called a, it has a value here three, and and b has or pi has a value three point one four whatever. Um, and in C, unlike in Java, you can actually have a whole array here, which which is actually going to be living on the stack. It doesn't have to be allocated with malloc or whatever. It's just living here. And each of its numbers are, are here in this activation record. That's a really good one. Um, um, so uh, so this might be you know, uh, some, some array of some sort. In, in Java, that you won't do that. You'll have a reference to an array of heap. Okay? But in, in See, you can actually have an array in your activation record, which means you don't have to call malloc and you free it. It just gets created when you create call foo. And then what's up above it? Foo calls. Four. Okay, so this goes above it, right? Mm -hmm. And there could be a variable called a here, and it's not going to interfere with this <coughs> one at all. Just inside a bar, sorry, inside a bar, um, a will refer to, to this, what's ever in here, five. Um, and B will refer to, or pi, well, hopefully pi. Okay, I won't get into that. Um, uh, but you could have other, other things living here. And similarly, this will cause baz, and this will call zap. Familiar stuff, right? What happens when zap returns? It's popped up. What's zap? <laughs> What's zap? Okay, it's popped up. Yeah, it, it's zap, right? This activation record, ladies and gentlemen, goes away. Okay. So yalla. Okay, so that goes away. Um, it's it, and we're back to Baz, and Baz continues to execute. And Baz returns. This goes away, right? And we're back to Bar, and Bar does some computations, and Bar goes away, and we're back to Foo, right? Is that comfortable? Yeah. And then maybe Foo calls after that. It calls off to. Okay, now, now we're in bad trouble. Um, calls off the paths, uh, which is zap backwards. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it goes on. Okay, um, okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's how, this, how the activation record stacks work in C, in Java, in C++, in C Sharp. Um, you can pick any number of different languages, Swift, Objective-C, what have you. Okay, great. I would challenge you that that can't work reliably for Python. Why not? Why not? Okay, let's think about it in Python. Let's think in Python. Um, in Python, um, maybe you're sick of thinking in Python. <laughs> Sorry, but uh, one more for the Gipper, okay? Um, before vacation, okay? Um, Okay, so in Python, we're going to have um, okay, we're going to have um, uh, custom custom append um, custom append prefix. Okay, this is going to be a uh, 
a, a, a function, I'm gonna write it in lambda notation. It will take in lam, lambda, okay? Um, okay, uh, lambda um, takes in a prefix and it returns a, we're gonna be good Pythonistas, um, and it returns a lambda that takes in some some value, some some string, and it returns it returns str prefix concatenated with that string. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, what is this? This is an instance. We we've done what? We've we've taken the append function and we have what? We've made what delicious dish out of it? A begins with a C. It's a popular dish in the Indian subcontinent. Curry. We curry it, right? Now it takes one of its arguments and then the other returns the result. And so having done this, we could then create a function. And it's, yes, it's a toy example, but this gets really useful. Um, we could have a function, you know, um, um, uh, prefix, um, prefix, uh, uh, 371. Or not, sorry, 470. Well, 371. That's not to the side of the Okay, 470. And and this is going to be this custom custom append prefix. And it's going to call it with what sort of string, do you think? Um, it's going to call it with with uh, 470. Okay? So so what is this going to be? This is going to be a function. Going to be, I'll put a function here. And what's the job in life of this function? So we create it by calling this function with str prefix being 470. So what are we getting back? What does this function do? What's it do in life? Prepends 470. 470. So you give it a string and it will put 470 in front of it, right? Okay. Um, okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, now let's consider how we would apply this, okay? Um, so, so we're going to uh, consider now if we call, for example, prefix uh, 470 function with um, with the the string is great, um, okay? Uh, what will this return back? I'm not asking you to evaluate the truthhood of it. What will it return back when I call that? Four seventy is pretty good. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so so this will return back that. Okay, now let's think about what's going on in the stack here. And I apologize because I have to reuse some space here. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, what's going to go on here? Um, let's consider now our calling off to this thing, okay? Custom append prefix. We're going to call this custom append prefix, okay? Um, append prefix. And maybe we're calling this from main, you know, from some, some overall function. We're calling it from there, okay? We're inside main here. Okay, so I'm calling off to this guy, and I'm passing it an argument str prefix, right? Passing it this argument str prefix. And store prefix is going to refer to some value, str prefix. Um, and this value is going to point to some thing in the heap here, which is going to say, in this case, 470, right? So store prefix is going to, is going to be referring to that in the context of this function, okay? It's going to be bound to this, store prefix, okay? So within this scope, it's going to be bound to it. The problem is, ladies and gentlemen, that, that if this guy returns, normally we forget about what store prefix refers to. We'd get back this function, but it wouldn't know where in the world this thing refers to. It'd return it back from here. And it wouldn't know where does this thing return to? Where does it point to? Because it's forgotten it, because this stack frame this activation record is now gone. Sadiawa. It's gone. Okay? 
It got wiped off in a C-like language. And as a result, if you tried in C to do this, don't try it at home, um, you would have severe problems because it's going to say, I don't know what this corresponds to. Even if you could nest functions in C, this wouldn't work because this value would be gone by the time you're back here. And then you try to call it with this, and you would get a core dump or a bust error or some other thing um, that's adverse. Um, so strip prefix would get wiped away if we just had call records. So guess where Python stores certain stacks? The information that's normally stored in a stack in a language like C or C++ or C Sharp or Java or, or Objective-C. Where does it store this thing? Where does it have to store this thing so strip prefix survives? It's all in the heap. It stores it in the heap. Oh my gosh. Okay, now we're really in a difficult situation because stack provides a very nice structured way to temporarily store things and get rid of them very quickly. You can just wipe out this whole thing quickly and you can call a new thing. And now we have to go allocate memory for, for the environment that remembers what stir prefix is. So we actually have to have a memory of the environment which will say stir prefix points to this thing, is bound to this thing. And this is called the environment. And that actually has to be, a reference to that has to be returned back with this function. So a, a closure consists of two things. One is a reference to the environment, and one is a reference to some function, which is going to be some you know, memory address um, in, in hex, typically, we write it. But it's, it's to some function. So this is what a closure looks like. A closure acts as a reference to an environment, and it has a reference to a function. And this is true on a cross-language basis. When, when a language supports closures in a true first-class way, it, this is what, how they're represented, a reference to an environment and a reference to a function. And that, that is needed. We need to put this thing not whoa, on the stack. We need to put it in the heap because it would get wiped away on the stack. So now, our way of calling new functions is different. It's got a it's got a heap allocate thing. So not only are we allocating whoa, allocating new values in the heap all the time, but we're actually allocating closures in the heap. And if you're producing this in a loop, it's going to be creating new ones of these on an ongoing basis. If you're just calling this thing in a loop, it's not going to be creating a new one, but it will be calling it every time. And ladies and gentlemen, I would emphasize that if you call map, if you were to call map, oh, what a beautiful function. Oh, man. If you were to call, ladies and gentlemen, map here, map with this, this function uh, as an argument, remind me, map. Which one comes first? Uh, is it first. It's function first? OK. So if we were to call it with prefix 470 function, OK? Um, and we were to call it on some big, big array of size a million, what will happen? So this is going to be called some list in, in Python, size a million. I told you map is implemented in C. And so actually, map can run things really quickly. But what's not going to be implemented in C? Accessing the array itself. Sorry? Accessing the array itself. OK, uh, that's, that's true. It's going to have to do some work. It's not going to be an efficient C array like, like this guy. Um, it's not going to be something like that. That much is true. Um, but so it's going to have to go through some data structure that's more complicated. But what's going to be what's going to be often a killer here? If this is a size million array, what's going to be really expensive? What is it going to be doing for every element of the array? This map may be in C. It's it's doing things close to the metal, wicked fast for each element. Maybe not in parallel, which could gain an even bigger speed up in in many contexts. But it's doing things close to the metal and a tight loop. But what has it got to do for each element of array? What's it got to call? Who are you going to call? Function. Yeah, you're going to call this function. 
or Ghostbusters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, you could have named it presciently. Um, <laughs> but you're going to call this function every time. Is this function in C? No. no. Now, you could pass in um, a function in uh, in Python, you could pass in a function that is in C. It's a built-in function. Let's say the len function, the length of a string. You could pass that in here instead of this one. And that one would actually execute much faster because the actual function itself is in C. This prefix thing, this is not in C. This is in what language? It begins with a P, ends with an M. Python. Python. This is in Python. So for each element of this, it's actually going to be calling off to this function, calling off to this closure for each time. And so map may be wicked fast. And maybe if you pass map a built-in thing in Python, like length, the len, len function, um, maybe this would go very fast. But since you're passing in a function that was created in Python, it's actually going to not go that fast at all. So. Ladies and gentlemen, a lot of things, big picture, a lot of things have to be allocated in the heap in Python. Have to be put, have to have memory explicitly allocated. It's like tons of calyx or malix behind the scenes. It's taken care of for you, but the cost doesn't go away. And there's a lot of cost associated with certain operations. Even if the built-in things are, are, are fast, what they use may not be fast. Um, Another thing which you'll find sometimes getting you is um, is even it's, it's a little bit of a, of a perhaps a dumb thing, but but it actually takes some time. So Python is an interpreted language, and when you use a variable, it has to figure out where does that variable live. So maybe you refer to a, and it has to figure out where is this a? Is this a inside my current function? Is it? Is it instead uh, an, uh, an A that was sort of created in a closure around me? Is it an A out in the global space? And you'll actually have to look this up when it's referring to A. And as a result, um, it can take longer to find this. Is it in an imported library? And so when it has to look up, rather than just finding it in a local variable, it actually has to go through several steps for each of those, particularly for things that are global or things that are in, a, um, in an imported package. Um, so I said map filter and reduce your compiled code. There's C code. But if, if, if you pass in a closure, it's going to be calling that. Um, now, it turns out the performance trade-offs associated with Python have changed a lot, ladies and gentlemen, between Python 2 and 3. And one of the big things you get in Python 3 is laziness. Um, and in the oddness of computer lingo, laziness here is a, is a good thing. Good because basically it won't force you to do some computations until you need them. And I say particularly that, for example, map is, is lazy. What's the implication of that? Suppose you do map over a very large array. Um, why is it effective? Why is it favorable that it's lazy? That's right. So maybe maybe you compute it on an array that's very large, but you end only end up using the first 100 elements because you're scanning for a value. You're looking for a value, the first value that's non-negative in, that, in, that, in the result of that map. And then f having found that, you, have its, you, you perhaps have its index. You wouldn't do that with map, but you might do it with, uh, with um, for example, uh, reducing it, or you, you might more likely you do it with some thing that, that just iterates over it for the first 100 items, finds it, returns the, the value, the index of the first non-negative thing, and you don't have to use the rest of it. By contrast, in Python 2, it's going to be producing a whole array, say, of 10,000 items, and you only end up searching the first 100. So, Laziness actually can save quite a bit of effort. Um, now, I want to show you a Python profiler, and then I'll talk about one bigger picture thing. Now, um, for those who are watching this, this is going to be over my Linux side, so I'm not going to be able to uh, 
to show you on the screen. But what I did is uh, I ran Python here um, using a, and unfortunately it's, um, uh, it was a, a, uh, Eclipse there. Okay, so here we go. Um, so I ran it with this module um, C profile, uh, which is uh, supported within Python. And basically what that will do is run a profiler on the, skit, on the script that you provide it here. And, you know, I'll, I'll run it. I've set it running. It's actually performing the computation, I think, for uh, at least a thousand iterations of this. And it actually is running this code in an instrumented form. Instrumented because it's actually recording for each, you know, where it's spending its time. Um, it may be periodically waking up and saying, where am I? Or it may be when you enter a function, recording the time you enter it and the time you leave it. So this is gonna take a bit of time. And in fact, it's gonna take a little bit longer because the profiler is running here. Um, but it's gonna produce for us a report similar to this one above. And this report is gonna give us a breakdown of where the time is being spent. Very importantly, ladies and gentlemen, one of the most important things to realize, the report's also gonna tell you where the time is not being spent. And therefore, it lets you figure out, okay, where should I invest my efforts and where should I go loose? Um, I, I don't have to worry about it. And uh, because it's taking a bit of time, I am going to scroll up here and you can see it's a rather, uh, a rather long report here. But the thing to look for here is in this cumulative time, for example, in total time area, um, what you will find is that um, uh, certain areas of the program, not surprisingly, are taking more times than others. Um, uh, not surprisingly, run scenario, which is used to run the entire scenario for the uh, for a simulation run is taking a lion's share of time here um, uh, about 120 um, 120 seconds for just a single call and you could see the number of calls to it is just one by contrast this count live neighbors is of those 120 or so spent here it's actually spending about 85 of it in this count live neighbors um, uh, this count live neighbors um, code, where it's counting up the number of live neighbors. So this code here is a significant bottleneck. It's spending most of the time of this entire simulation run counting the number of neighbors around a given cell um, which are uh, occupied. By contrast, there's lots of other things going on here. Um, array print stuff. Um, some core Python uh, logic, um, you know, various uh, split lines that I call and reduce, et cetera. But those things are taking peanuts in terms of time, okay? And it finally did finish here. Um, this allows me to, to sort of go in and, and take a look at what's going on. And if we were to, in this context, if we're gonna go back to, to Windows land here, we could go in and, and look at this context um, and you know we could try to figure out okay what what is going on in count neighbors count live neighbors that is taking time and in python 2 and 2 and 3 it's going to be different these ranges in python 2 i think are fairly inefficient to call them in this way but in python 3 you're going to uh, you're going to have them um, you're going to be able to uh, just have to produce an iterator. Still, for this inner one here, you're going to be reproducing minus one, zero, one each time through this loop. Each of these rows, you're going to be reproducing it for here. So you might be able to optimize that. Um, another thing you might do is, is inline the call to count live neighbors and what calls it. Um, you also don't need to handle the case zero. So you could unroll this loop and just handle uh, each of eight cases. So this is uh, an example, ladies and gentlemen, of the use of a profiler. A profiler will help you spot where it's taking time and it will help you spot where it's not taking time and where you don't have to worry that much. One thing I will emphasize though, in the context of Python, is that there can be significant time spent in Lambda expressions. For example, this one here. Now this is not to say this lambda by itself takes all this time. What it's saying is within the lambda, it's actually taking some time. And if you go in and you look at the lambda, 
it includes a call to count live neighbors in this case. So the lambda expression is taking time partly because it's calling something which is very exp uh, very expensive. Okay, so um, these are some comments, but I want to uh, also uh, remind you that when it comes to use of profilers, a lot of the goal is to figure out where the bottlenecks are and to focus on those and, uh, and to try to optimize things so that the, uh, the code can be significantly sped up by just changing small areas of that code. Um, and that's what a profiler can, combine, can provide. Now it turns out Python has a number of implementations. For example, Cython, uh, the C version of, Cy of Python can compile down to C. That's gonna help you with some things, but it won't help you with everything. For example, it won't help you with this whole data layout issue. You're still gonna be allocating tons of memory. What it will help you with is the interpretation issue. Similarly, um, Jython, which compiles down to the Java virtual machine, that's gonna help you, uh, speed you up in terms of interpretation, um, cut away uh, interpretive overhead, but once again, you're gonna be left with some of these other features that are still going to cost you because they're part of the language semantics, the meaning of the language that can't be easily changed. So, ladies and gentlemen, Python as a, um, as a general tool is going to have some pretty steep performance trade-offs relative to C-like languages. And the question is not which language do we always use? The question is, which language do we use for the job at hand and for the area of the job at hand? Python is going to be appropriate for certain types of computations and not others. For scripting languages, it can be very effective for certain areas of our program, which have to be written in a, a flexible fashion, a clean fashion, but where performance is not a bottleneck, it can be an effective tool. But if you're going to use it for a heavy duty, you know, heavy lifting computation, as the core loops, you're going to typically be hurting because of it, as you saw in this code base. Orders of magnitude uh, reductions in performance compared to C. Okay, so those are some comments on performance in Python. Any, any questions about this material? Questions about it? What do you think of a Python? How did your code for Python, in terms of writing Python code compared to C code? It wasn't bad once I got into it. Wasn't too bad in terms of um, uh, sort of representing the, the basic algorithms and so on, once you learn the basics of it. Uh, it's a pretty nice language from terseness, conciseness perspective, from not having a lot of extra cruft going on, and also for doing things at a higher level sometimes, right? You can build atop these primitives. If you build on top of them the right way, it can be actually not that inefficient. If you know what you're doing, you're using built-in things. One thing you should think about in the context of performance is, for example, this closure. If this is the closure which is used for very large data sets, you can code it. In many languages, you have the option of calling off to other languages. So often what you'll do for a large program is you'll figure out where the inner loops are You'll keep it in the language of your choice, maybe for the much of the program, but those certain places you'll call off to another language. So you might call off, for example, to um, code for you know, counting the live neighbors, which is actually in a different language, and therefore it's more efficient. Um, so what would, uh, what would you say in terms of the size of the code for Python versus C? Which, which, which do you think could be um, readably done shorter? Python, Python, yeah. And I think part of that is the higher level nature of it. Part of it is just the syntax of it, um, not needing to put curly braces in and occupy a line or two, you know, for a, for a deep loop. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, those higher level functions um, can can make like reading in a reading in a file um, simpler. Um, any questions other than this on sort of Python and use? Okay, um, we're going to after the, the the break. We're going to be taking this code 
and we're going to be re-rendering it in an object-oriented context. And we're going to see how we can do similar things within Java, a language of familiarity to you. And we're going to, with Java, actually make use of Java 8 constructs. So we'll make use of, of lambda expressions, and we'll see how uh, streams can be used as well, and parallel streams also, and still be of, of assistance. Okay. Um, but we only have a few minutes now, and I want to bring us back to something I had thought would occupy much of the um, the time, but we're, we're going to have to leave till um, till till next time. Um, and uh, I'm going to have to ask you to to uh, probably try some some of these yourself. I held off for this class because I knew about some deliverables, and um, I'd like you to. Uh, to challenge yourself with some examples um, before next class. So you'll recall that we talked about the Liskov substitution principle as a principle that has to do with formulating, formulating guidelines for safe subtyping. For what it means for one class to not only tell, have the compiler think it's a genuine subtype, but for it to be a behavioral subtype, to be a legitimate subtype, a subtype that won't cause bugs and things that use it. And we started to talk about um, some examples uh, of these. And I want to I wanna run through a couple more examples and then get you going on a larger set in time for, your, for the next class. OK, so um, you may recall that we're trying to formulate principles that will give us, give us these guidelines as to whether a subtype is legitimate or not. A be legitimate behavioral subtype. So here's a supertype, counter, get, and increment, and here's a potential subtype. It claims to be a subtype of it. After all, it extends it. And as a result, Java, okay, I don't know why this uh, thing, okay, how can I get rid of this? There. Um, uh, here we have a, uh, a class, it, it's a subclass. So because it's a subclass, Java will let us pass it around as if it's a counter, right? This my counter too, it can be passed around as a counter. The compiler would be perfectly happy. The question is, is this a legitimate subtype? If someone ha thought they had a counter, remember this is the key thoughts you should be going through. If someone thought they had a counter, the super type, and they actually had a counter too, could they be rudely surprised? Could they, could their code, counting on properties of this, encounter an error because it secretly got one of these passed into it? As if it's a counter. Passed in due to polymorphism, passed in as if it masquerading as a counter. Could this cause problems? Yes or no? Okay, so. So it uh, seems that all it does is provide one extra function here, right? It doesn't change get. It doesn't change increment. Is it possible this could cause a problem? Anyone see a problem here? I would I'd just note that this contains 0 as its initial value. And you can get it, or you can increment it. In this case, it increments it by one. Is there something you could get with this lower one that you can't get with this top one? You don't expect the counter to go back to zero at any point. Mm. Okay, so this top one, any value you get from this lower one, because it can only be reset to things greater than or equal to zero, you could get to this top one, right? So the issue is not a particular value you get with the lower one, you can't get with the top one. Anything you can get with the lower one, you can get with the top one, so you won't be surprised by the value. It's not like you'll get a negative value. However, who was that the Senate? Name? Graham. Graham. So, however, what will be different is, in this top one, you should never see a counter value decrease, right? It should never go down. If you're dealing with the same counter you will were five minutes ago, it should never be lower. It could be the same, 
or it could be one higher. But it'll never be lower. By contrast, this one down here could be lower. So someone could be, in principle, counting on the fact this will never decline, have code that counts on that, and be surprised. How about this one here? And we'll leave this as the last one. Dual counter. OK, so, so um, here's the superdential supertype. Um, uh, excuse me, this is, this, is this a subtype of counter, a legitimate subtype of counter? So here we, we can call get, and it will return the result of the first counter. Get two will return the result of the second counter. Is that a legitimate subtype of counter? I remind you, counter just had get increment in the constructor, this guy up here. So is this guy a, s a legitimate subtype of counter? It implements get, returns the value of the first counter, uh, and it increments counter one, but it also provides similar increments and gets for a second counter. It maintains two counters, of course. Is that a legitimate subtype? Yes. Okay. Anyone disagree? Legitimate subtype? It is a legitimate subtype. Um, you, if you had one of these and you just thought it was a counter, you wouldn't be surprised. There's, there's nothing that's screwed up. How about with a swappable? How if you could swap them now? No. Why, why is that? The value change. Sorry? The value could go down. The value could go down because of that. OK, so, so this latter one is not a legitimate subtype. Uh, it's not a legitimate subtype even of dual counter. There's a property that it doesn't maintain, the property that it never declines. Um, and someone who thinks they have one of these, or thinks they have a counter, and instead is given one of these, could be really, really surprised. Their code is counting the fact that it never declines. They spent, you know, their code was written 10 years ago. All they had was a counter then. And they studied counter very carefully and said, it will never decline. I'm going to count on that fact. And now suddenly you've given them something where that they can no longer count on that. So their code, which was written long before your code, has suddenly been broken by your code, which uses a swappable dual counter and passes it in. That's what we want to avoid. We want to avoid new classes breaking old code that uses them polymorphically. So for a, a, a new subtype to be legitimate, it needs to adhere to these rules of the Liskov substitution principle that I introduced last time. And that includes history properties, any property that compares its value at one time and value at another time, and they could be counting on that, like it never declines, it only rises, it's always the same. Those are things the subtype has to maintain. So if you have an immutable value, ladies and gentlemen, an immutable value, a value that can never change as a supertype, you can't violate for that for the subtype. Or they could be rudely surprised. They're counting in their code, this value is always the same, and then suddenly it's tweaked out from under them that it changes and their code breaks. Maybe they've stored it in a hash table as the key, and now you've, you've screwed it up. You know, suddenly you've modified the key in their hash table, and the hash table isn't working properly. Big problems. So immutability is one example. An example with, with values that decline is another. So with the Liskov substitution principle, we need to maintain properties that we can prove using the supertype. So I'll give you some examples of this. I'll ask you to work through them. A break, and I will look forward to... Uh,